Welcome everybody to this session of the Learning Analytics Learning Network. Um, good morning or good evening, wherever you are. Welcome and uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce my colleagues from UniSA and their collaborators from uh, Praxera and Data61. They're going to be talking about technological frameworks on ethical and trustworthy learning analytics. And I believe that Justin is going to share the link to our learning analytics learning network website. So have a look if you're not familiar with it and I'll hand it over to Sreshko. Thank you, Flo, and thank you, Justin. So, uh, Justin, uh, I guess we will just we'll be taking questions as we go through. So, uh, I will. I guess I will just introduce the team and uh, get us started. But uh, just because I know Justin and Flo, but uh, we have here we have quite a big team today uh, with uh, Ruth and Jazia from Practera, and basically they uh, lead the project you will be hearing about today, and um, they basically. Ruth and, and Jazia are actually uh, the most important experts behind the whole idea, uh, someone who conceptualized the whole idea of trusted learning analytics and uh, currently leading the whole project here and his team from Data61. They are leading the, uh, all the work on data privacy and uh, you will hear more about that in a minute as well. And Chen and I, Chen and myself, well, we do have something important. Yeah, we are running the learning analytics team from, from UniSA and uh, you will see where we are at the moment and how the whole thing uh, looks uh, looks when we put it in the together. So uh, we will, let me see if this can go. As I said to Justin, feel free to, to jump in if you have any questions, I guess Justin will be looking at the chat and I'll try to, uh, to keep an eye there as well. So, before we go into some uh, technical details and what we, what we propose as a solution towards trusted or privacy preserving learning analytics, we'll provide a bit of the overview of why we talk about data privacy in the first place, <clears throat> where we are at the moment in educational research more broadly and learning analytics in the context of uh, um, analytics and, and privacy. Into, we will further introduce the solution and talk about some of the use cases that we currently develop. And at the end, I guess we will uh, talk about some steps of how we see things moving forward. But before we move forward, I guess we should just take a step back and uh, just remind ourselves where the whole thing, where, where, uh, why we talk about data and what's the importance of data and learning analytics research and educational research these days more broadly, I would say. So although the concept, the idea of learning analytics emerged uh, some 10, 11 years ago, uh, the whole concept of learning analytics can be traced back all the way to 1920s and the work of uh, Prezi, who developed the first automated teaching, uh, teaching machine. Uh, this, this teaching machine was kind of marked the start of intelligent tutoring systems that represent one of the key areas uh, upon which uh, learning analytics draws, but uh, of course, this system wasn't called uh, intelligent tutoring system at the time. This concept emerged much, much later. Uh, another critical uh, influence that, uh, that has been the development of cognitive science, which originated in the work of Miller in 1956, and uh, new advances in computer and uh, science and uh, artificial intelligence, and we hear about this uh, these days quite a lot. Then in 1956, the first adaptive teaching uh, system known as self-adaptive keyboard instructor was developed for teaching keyboard skills. This uh, system or Saki was optimi would optimize learning uh, rates by aligning the difficulty of uh, the task with the learner's performance. So as you can see, this was, uh, this, this was, these were some very basic measures compared to what we measure today, but they did serve to demonstrate how the student learning can be supported using uh, the, the, the technology and how we can support learners, learners at scale. And I guess you're all familiar with the recent developments and the uh, emergence of the, uh, the first learning analytics conference back in 2011 and uh, that um, Society for Learning analytics, analytics Research was established in 2012. And then in 2017, the first handbook of learning analytics was, was published. 
I guess everything else is the history, right? So um, what changed through all this time? What, what, what's significantly different uh, compared to some of the beginnings is that we every, every day uh, uh, with development of, of technologies, with uh, technological advances, we have more and more data. So um, here, by, this is by, by, by no means the final set of, of data sources that we use in learning analytics. These are just some of the very, uh, very few um, uh, data environments that we and uh, data collection methods that we used that you can find in some of the uh, original research in learning, uh, learning analytics, starting from student information systems, learning environments, library management systems, all the way to some of multimodal data using the video, audio, gesture, or all kinds of fancy sensors that we use nowadays in, in uh, teaching and learning. So, and sorry for the background noise, Shane is busy with his meetings here. So as we all, as we all know, uh, with more data, we, we thought we can do anything, right? So uh, there is this saying a uh, few years back that basically all models are wrong, but some are used, right, by, by George Box. Um, at some point, we thought that basically, uh, if we have enough data, we don't really need to, to show causation. Correlation should be enough. Um, and all the big data that, that made an impact on digital marketing landscape and um, not just in education, but more broadly. However, sometime in 2014 and 2015, uh, we actually realized that um, data is, is not enough, especially in, if we talk about learning analytics and education and supporting students. So as Alisa Weiss and David Schaefer noted uh, back then in, in this um, special section on uh, theory and learning analytics, so what counts as a meaningful finding uh, when the number of data points is so large that something will be always significant, right? So with, with uh, huge amounts of data, huge amounts of data points about learners and they are learning, something will pop up a significant predictor of whatever we are trying to predict, right? In that case, are we using valid data? Can we generalize to different contexts and how we use those findings to to inform the feedback to students like like for example there's this really nice uh, study uh, uh, that uh, David Sheffield talks about quite a lot that basically um, back in 2005 researchers show that uh, chess expertise can be predicted by how, how rapidly a player makes their moves right so if we just tell the beginner to move more more quickly that won't necessarily help them right so they just might, might lose faster. So the same thing is with, with learning and, and, uh, and, uh, and teaching. So if we know that, that some resources uh, might be a negative, like for example, if those early studies in MOOCs show that accessing some of the uh, resources might be detrimental for learning. So what are we going to do? We're gonna tell students, please keep those resources, right? Well, probably not, I hope. And, uh, as more and more social and economic activities help place online, the importance of privacy and, uh, and data protection is increasingly recognized all over the world. Of equal concern, I guess, uh, would be the data collection, data use, sharing of personal information to third parties. And uh, now we have that, uh, I think, 130 or 128 countries out of uh, 194 had put in place legis legislation to secure protection and privacy of data, right? But I think right now it's time to talk a little bit about uh, privacy and data in, in education. So Yeah. So thank you very much, um, Stretchko. And far from being uh, playing a small part, it's uh, work with um, Abelardo, Stretchko, and David Schaffer and others um, that has led to this project, really. So we're a, an ed tech company, Practera. You'll hear a little bit more about us from, from Jazia in a minute. And, uh, and, you know, a lot of what we're about is um, better understanding how we can service our students and, and improve the way they learn on our platform. So um, that's really how we came to this project. So I'm trying to work with some of the best um, learning analytics people 
uh, around the place, including um, UniSA and uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison and, and finding the struggles that we were having, sharing data with them and, and getting, doing things in a way that we, we also uh, felt was ethical and trustworthy. So um, that's uh, just a bit of background on how we came to the product, project. But um, really what we're looking at is uh, with great power, obviously, comes great responsibility. And I guess that's what we're saying today. So there's a number of issues around data and education, and, and Rajko just alluded to some of them. Um, ethics and, and, and trust being the first. Now you're going to get, a, um, I've sat on about three ethical AI working groups this year. So there's something in the air right now, um, ethics and AI and, and uh, trust um, are becoming quite the center of attention. Um, and um, not before time, I think, but um, it's certainly there's something also that's beginning to catch the imagination of the, of the uh, actual end consumer. So um, going back as far, you know, 2011 and earlier, um, when, when learning analytics was really still quite young, there were already um, considerations around ethics and trust. Um, and there's also the concept of um, trying to understand it from the question of perspective of what we're trying to do with that analytics, right? So is it is it sort of um, looking at it from an academic through an academic lens and trying to say, uh, uh, to better understand how people learn or is it looking at the more of an operations um, um, research lens, which is trying to improve the way we deliver our services as institutions to our students and become more cost effective and so on. And what are the ethical implications of that? So there's a lot of discussion around the analytics themselves, what we're doing with those, what the purpose of them and, and, and what the ethical sort of stance is behind those. But there's also the, a lot around data, right? Um, as um, Srechko said, as we gather more data, as the analytics become more powerful, um, the responsibility becomes more intense. So we need to think about questions such as informed consent uh, and that informed consent has to be reversible. And right now the systems that we have in place don't really allow, we've got a lot of um, GDPR ready apps that sort of um, follow students or you know, do sort of typical Google, Google analytics style um, uh, analysis of, of students online behavior um, but we haven't got the take capability um, behind the scenes to actually realistically take that student out of our data sets um, once they've been included in. So there's a whole lot of considerations um, that are several layers down in the technology that we haven't yet got our heads around in terms of proper informed consent and people being able to remove themselves from a data set sometime in the future. Um, but there's also then just the simple question of how that data is interpreted, where, how it's linked, who owns it, uh, how it's classified and stored, how it's managed, um, and all those sorts of questions um, that are being um, asked in a very um, significant way now and are part of what we're trying to sort of get our heads around as, um, as software uh, education technology providers. So um, along with that, there's the actual insights that the learning analytics um, generate. It can be very consequential. And the more um, in-depth those insights are, the more they could impact to the future of um, our students. Um, but also um, there's questions around how those insights are used and whether those insights have unforeseen um, future impacts such as the removal of agency from that student if we're taking some decisions away from them or not allowing them to make mistakes through our very intelligent um, systems. What have we actually done to their learning process? Um, and again, who owns those insights? Who has rights to them? How are they going to be passed on? Um, and so on. So there's a whole lot of questions around the analytics themselves and not least of which again if we're generating more insights, more information about an individual, we're also increasing the risk of them being compromised if there are breaches. Um, and then there's the question of um, the identification of, of an individual themselves from that data. Uh, again, there's a lot of research, goes back a long way, and Thierry's going to talk about some of that later. Um, but <clears throat> as a one from an ex-colleague of mine, Anne Thierry, is actually a research that they did several years ago at um, 
uh, Data61 um, into Facebook um, public profile data. And they were finding that the actual, the, the absolute most single most um, uh, potent piece of data from your um, uh, public um, profile um, is, um, is um, your uh, city of birth or city of, of where you're living. And if you combine that with some very simple stuff such as gender and age, 55% of individuals with those public profiles could be identified. So it doesn't take a great deal of information, far less than people think, to be able to identify an individual from even very large pieces of data where you would think an individual would be very well hidden. So we need to think about that. And, that, and so when we start getting into some of the techniques that we're looking at, we need to think about, you know, are, there, are the protections that we are providing or we think we're providing sufficient to really protect somebody's individual um, risk of re-identification. And then hand in hand with that, there's all this, all the issue of cyber insecurity, as we now call it. Um, we, you know, breaches, I don't need to, I was going to give a whole load of um, statistics around the number of breaches and how they've gone up, but I don't think that's actually necessary. We're all seeing ransomware attacks and cyber attacks in the news, what feels like on a daily basis. And obviously, um, the more we pull data together from different sources in order to enrich our data sets to make learning analytics more powerful, the higher the risk uh, and impact on an individual if there's breach. So clearly um, those two issues go hand in hand. Um, so those are all the sort of issues that surround us when it comes to um, education. Do you want to move on? Um, so that means we need something, right? We need some frameworks in this in, in our um, learning analytics to start dealing with that. Um, so, and I see it very much as a pyramid. There's obviously, when we talk about frameworks for managing data privacy and also some of those other ethical uh, issues that um, I talked about, um, everyone lands on trust as being the foundational sort of piece that you're trying to put in place. You're trying to make sure that that trusting relations, trusted relationship between your data subjects and yourselves um, is maintained and enhanced. And certainly that's really important because without trust, you haven't got anything. And including, you can do all the analytics you like. If people don't trust what you're doing, um, they're not going to cooperate in terms of um, take, getting any benefit out of those. Um, so certainly trust is important, um, but it's only the beginning. So when, and, and in order to um, establish trust, what we're really talking about is those sorts of basic hygiene, um, informed consent, the ability to withdraw that consent at any time, transparency, not just transparency on what information are you, do you have on me, uh, of mine, um, how are you using it? what pieces of those information actually are participating in any decision, automated decision making that, in, that is made about me? Have I got resource to reevaluate that process of decision making um, or conclusion um, in some other mechanism if, if I so ask? And uh, can I see how those conclusions were drawn? So there's a whole lot around that is the, almost what I would call table stakes. And that gets you some of the way there. But then we need to start looking at risk management at a higher level, <clears throat> looking forward, trying to understand what it means when we have really large, vast groups, um, pieces of data um, pulled together for analytics purposes in order to give us the sort of results that we're looking for. And also how the landscape is changing from a legislative perspective. So Stretch Go showed you um, that map further up. We have highly punitive um, legislation in, in Europe, which is well publicized in GDPR. We've got um, legislation coming into um, force now in India. We've got legislation for the first time in the US even. And when the US is catching up, we know that the world is really um, getting somewhere on, on um, punitive legislation. So we need to be on top of it just from managing our corporate risk um, or our organizational risk. And that's all around governance and compliance and putting frameworks in place that can show that you are taking steps to protect people's privacy um, in a way that is um, sort of uh, systematic and um, predictable and uh, auditable. And then on top of that, you then have to have some 
processes in place which start giving you some more freedoms to operate. And what that's all about is taking very restricted procedural uh, guidelines and trying to build them into your platforms and your environments to give, uh, which will actually introduce degrees of freedom. And what do I mean by that? I mean, <clears throat> risk measurement, for example. Um, there's a lot of um, interesting research being done around how people think of privacy risk. And there's a lot of research that shows that people think that by removing immediate identifiers that they've really significantly reduced that risk um, far more than they actually have, as I sort of indicated with that Facebook public profile example. Um, but there's also the other side where there isn't enough visibility of the kind of risks that's inherent in a data set. Um, it can be a major inhibitor to people actually doing what they would like to do or what they would really be beneficial to do with that data. And there was a little study that was, um, uh, I think, presented at LAC21 um, from uh, June Ahn from University of California, Irvine, where he actually started, um, he built a beautiful little user interface for, this is K-12 um, professionals, um, educators, and uh, asked them to sort of, whenever they had some data available that, they, that should, could have been shared with somebody else for some reason, um, that they asked them to sort of answer whether or not they were gonna share that data and explain why they made the decision not to share or to share. And quite often, surprisingly, they decided, uh, they erred on the side of caution. Well, not surprisingly, I suppose. So in other words, data wasn't shared where it might've been helpful for a student to, to share that data. And, not, and because they didn't really understand um, the um, level of risk that was associated with that and didn't have any strong guidelines around how um, they should um, assess that risk and whether or not they should be able to share under certain, those sort of different risk conditions. As more information was supplied about what was in that data and what the risk associated with that data was, they felt freer to actually share that data and do more with it. So there's a lot to be said for um, really in mechanizing the whole way in which we measure risk and um, putting strong or at least um, clear guidelines around how that data can then be used based on the risk. And that's a way of sort of giving people far more freedom to actually then make decisions on their own account about how to use that data responsibly. Um, and again, we can put policies around that. And then the last piece is around um, privacy um, enhancing technologies, um, which will then increase what you can do with that data again. So there's so far you can go with good measurement, good instrumentation, good frameworks and procedures. And Shreshko is gonna talk about um, in two minutes uh, uh, what those sort of what work's been done in learning analytics in that space already. Um, but then we could, we'll hit a wall because we can't do anything else and we have to start actually looking about how we reduce um, the risk of that data um, from a privacy perspective in order to be able to use it. And that's where you start getting into differential privacy, um, K anonymity and various other much more advanced technologies that um, will reduce the privacy risk and enable you to use that data better. And um, that really then starts to open up your opportunities to, to innovate to use broad sets of data, link and merge data from social media, from other sources without danger of massively increasing the risk to the individuals involved. So that's what we're gonna talk about um, in a little bit more detail today and what we've been looking at in this, uh, in this project. Um, so first of all, Shresh, do you wanna just talk about some of the frameworks that um, have already been put together? Yep, thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, so, uh, yeah, of course. So, I mean, um, somehow immediately after uh, we started the first research and learning analytics, we became aware that it's, uh, we need to take care of privacy, ethics, and ethical use of learning analytics and, and student data at the first place, right? So, very quickly, we had a lot of frameworks emerging around ethical use of data and ethical learning analytics and how we make sure that uh, we respect student privacy. So uh, in this, uh, in their work, uh, Yishan and Dragon published uh, a paper at the Learning Analytics Conference back in 2017, that actually did, where they um, 
consider some of those uh, existing frameworks at the time, and uh, they they looked at the. Uh, I don't want to hear shouting. What? Why are we? Up Xander, do not take Maisie from your brother. No, that uh, is his. Give it back right now. So, Flo, can you? Uh, yeah, just did it. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> so, without going into a um, uh, lot of details into the, um, the existing frameworks back at the time, uh, Yishan and Ragan uh, examined four dimensions associated with learning analytics research, including strategy, obligations, privacy protection, and I think data management and governance, and how each of those dimensions was addressed across the existing policies back at, at the time. So. One of the uh, interesting points from, from this, uh, this overview is that uh, data privacy, which is primary uh, topic of our research, was addressed in every single framework studied at the time. So in that regard, data anonymity was one of the most commonly addressed issues with the exist within the existing frameworks. Um, and I think that uh, most of the frameworks back then explicitly said uh, that uh, any data being collected will remain anonymous. Some of the frameworks like JISC and, and, and LACE um, even talk about, go beyond that, talking about uh, third parties. And even when data get transferred from one uh, party to another, that um, it can be transferred only as aggregate data, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But basically, uh, late, more, more recently, uh, Tore and, uh, and his group and later on, uh, Redenberg and, and Schaub talk about some of the uh, uh, principles and uh, safeguards for privacy that should be incorporated into, into the educational technology to actually make sure that we are respecting and we are following the guidelines that we actually put, put forward. So the next step from, uh, from uh, uh, prescribing uh, ethical use of learning ethics was basically to develop a frameworks that would make sure that we are following those, those guidelines. And uh, I didn't put here on the slide, but the first, uh, first uh, solutions that emerge around uh, collecting data and scaling up research in learning like this uh, came from MIT and CMU, uh, namely these were MOOC DB and uh, later on Discourse DB. And uh, the main goal of these systems was basically to make sure we collect data from various, various sources and allow researchers to do all kinds of uh, uh, research on, uh, on uh, not just on a single course data, but from data coming from different sources. And this course DB in that sense uh, went uh, beyond single platform. It, it was focused on basically collecting this course data from different social media platforms. But more recently, uh, um, more framework uh, uh, from work from Josh Gardner, Christopher Brooks and uh, uh, Ryan Baker and uh, um, and Miguel was focused basically on providing a technical solution for running learning analytics algorithm. So the framework actually sits on top of S3 buckets where S3 buckets where all the data would be collected, and we as researchers don't necessarily have access to data, but to results of the algorithms that we run. So we don't we reduce the risk of uh, sharing data across different platforms, different spaces. Data sits in one place, but all we do is basically we run the algorithm, we get results and we do our research. This, there is still, in that sense, there is still a risk of being able to identify users. So of course, data is kept anonymous, but as you will see uh, when we come to Thierry's part, that's not enough to protect student privacy. I mean, no critique to this amazing work. It's just that we wanted to take the step step beyond that. Another another uh, interesting technical solution that emerged recently is by uh, by uh, Hillman and, and Ganesh, the system called uh, Kratos, uh, that provides um, st students and schools with the immutable log along with comprehensive access to data that is otherwise scattered across different systems. So similar approach getting data from different systems, but focusing on, on, on K-12. And in this work, the focus was uh, basically placed on, on the aspect of data ownership, data accountability, auditability, and transparency. So that was the, the main idea. So basically, the, the whole point I'm trying to make here is that 
very early in the uh, with the development of the field of research analytics as a field of research and practice, we started with developing uh, principles and guidelines for ethical use of data, ethical use of learning analytics. After that, we came with uh, uh, several technical solutions or technological solutions emerged to ensure that we are actually respecting student privacy and that we are doing what we, those guidelines prescribe. And I think in the next few slides, yeah, we will have uh, Jazzy and Terry uh, talk a bit more about the steps that we take, uh, we took towards ensuring privacy-driven uh, analytics. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Draco. Um, so, hi everyone. Um, I'm Thierry, and I will um, give you a bit of an overview of the work we're doing around privacy. So, um, the first thing that I'd like to touch on um, when we talk about privacy, as mentioned earlier by Ruth and uh, Shreko, there's different lens to look at privacy. So, there's the lens of a regulator. Uh, which Ruf mentioned, where uh, you're looking at um, so basically laws and um, other uh, legal um, legal means to um, uh, address privacy issue. There's the lens of um, security. Um, Shreko mentioned Kratos, where they're looking more at uh, access control and auditing. Um, so another side of it is from the data itself. So um, when you're looking specifically at the, um, the characteristics intrinsic to the data that uh, gives rise um, to um, privacy issue. And this is uh, what uh, we uh, have been focusing about. Um, so what are these characteristics? So for example, there's the uniqueness. So uh, within, within a pool, within a, a sample of, of a population, uh, how unique are your record? Uh, there is trajectory, uh, for example, um, if a student interacts multiple time with a course or with a system with many courses, all of these records for that single student form a trajectory through a course or a trajectory through a program. And if, even if you remove the name of that student, even if you remove some what we call um, personal identifiers, um, knowing part of the trajectory might uh, give you some clues about uh, who that student uh, is. Uh, similarly, uniformity is another uh, characteristics of the data that is um, uh, leading to privacy uh, issue. For example, uh, the, more, the, the more consistent you, you interact with, with a system, um, the more likely uh, an, uh, um, someone might uh, be able to re-identify you. So if I'm into the habit of working on a course uh, from uh, six to five every Monday and four to six every Tuesday, as I do that through a program, um, someone that knows my working habit might be able to re-identify me um, through that. So these are all examples of how can uh, privacy uh, issue arise, even if you've been de-identifying data sets. Um, so <clears throat> as you can see, removing um, personal identifier is not, is not enough because um, someone with bad intention might bring to the table over auxiliary knowledge. And this auxiliary knowledge is what can be used to uh, re-identify, to de-identify, sorry, to right, re-identify a data set. Um, Ruth mentioned the example of Facebook earlier. Um, there is another example, very similar one. Uh, it's a study done um, a few years ago now uh, in the US on their um, census data. And it has been shown that with only uh, three bits of information, your gender, your zip code, and your date of birth, about 87% 80, of the US population was unique into that uh, census data. So date of birth to the day. Um, okay, next slide, please. Yeah, so what are we doing? Um, so first, uh, so we were focusing on these privacy issue that are in privacy characteristics, sorry, on these characteristics of the data set that is intrinsic to the data and gives privacy issue. So 
if we want to do something about it, we need to be able to measure it, right? So you cannot show that you've, you've moved the needle uh, on something if you cannot measure that. So part of what we've done is develop a matrix um, based on uh, information theory, uh, hidden mark of uh, chain models uh, and the likes. So we've designed metrics to be able to assess uh, privacy risk based on these characteristics of uniqueness, uniformity, trajectory, and so on. Um, we've implemented these tools, these metrics, sorry, in a software tool that we call R4, uh, which you have a little um, illustration there, a screenshot of the uh, UI of R4. But that tool also has an API which you can interact with program programmatically and so integrate it into your uh, workflow. And I believe uh, we will talk about it uh, a bit more in detail later. Next slide, please. Um, so once you manage to measure privacy risk, so once you have that number, what do you do about it? Um, so like uh, Shreko mentioned earlier, there, there are many other uh, mechanisms that um, people have used in the past to uh, reduce privacy risk. The first thing I'd like to note is that there's no free lunch. So every time you use these mechanisms, you impact on utility. Obviously, the best utility you'd get is to release the data as is. And the best privacy you get is to either not provide any data or provide garbage. So there is a sweet spot somewhere um, between these two extremes where you'd get a um, adequate uh, utility for the best achievable privacy. And that sweet spot is uh, not fixed for all applications. So it's dependent on application, right? And on, on the use case that you have. Uh, at that point, I'd like to mention that there's a lot of systems that have been used, which we call probable privacy. And we call them probable privacy because there's no mathematical guarantee uh, on, any of the privacy, uh, on any of the privacy characteristics that they offer. For example, there's removing uh, personal identifiers, so removing name and addresses. There's no guarantee. On, you cannot quantify how much privacy you offer there. Obfuscation, so uh, removing numbers aggregation, putting them all together. And then there's perturbation, like adding five plus, plus minus five to a number, for example. All these ad hoc mechanisms often fail. And when they fail, you find yourself uh, at the top of these uh, headlines. For example, I mean, these are some examples around us that we've had recently in Australia, where um, people used one of these methods and uh, the data that they thought were um, private, um, managed to what was de identified. Next slide, please. So, in this project, um, what we are focusing on is on provable mechanisms. So, as opposed to probable mechanisms, the provable mechanisms have uh, explicitly uh, mathematical guarantees, so formal proof on the achieved privacy. An example of that is. Uh, the well-known, um, uh, uh, sorry, the well-known approach of differential privacy, uh, which guarantee plausible deniability. So basically, if a mechanism is differentially private, that means that any output of that mechanism um, would be more or less the same if you have removed or included one individual from the original data set. So that allows that individual to plausibly deny that he or she was or not in that data set. So based on that approach of differential privacy, we've developed um, three different stream of work uh, where we're using differential privacy to generate synthetic data sets. So the old data set, we, gener we release an old data set and it's synthetic. So no individual in that data set is refers to the original individual and it's protected by differential privacy. We've uh, developed mechanisms to uh, release query on the data set. So you're not releasing the data set, but you're asking, for example, what are the top 10, the top five, uh, what, is, what is the median uh, of some characteristics on the data set. And last, 
uh, we have been looking at uh, mechanisms to modify uh, machine learning algorithms so that they also offer uh, provable uh, privacy guarantee. Uh, for example, we've uh, modified the gradient descent in some machine learning uh, models uh, to ensure uh, DP properties. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll leave it there for that brief overview of the research that we've been doing. Um, and I'm happy to take some questions later on. Thank you. Thanks, Thierry. So I think now we have, Jose, we will need to speed up a little bit, sorry. <laughs> I know, I feel like I have to pick up the pace now. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, uh, Srechko, Ruth, and Terry. So let me tell you a little bit more about Practera and the Trusted Analytics Project. So uh, Practera is an education and technology provider. We specialize in experiential learning and we, we handle like learning programs at scale. So we do have our own design programs, but we also offer an end-to-end -end solution where we work with educators to, um, we design with them the programs, we set up the, the programs, but we also manage to, the day-to-day -day operations. We uh, facilitate the experiences for the learners. And at the end, we can also provide an al analytical insights on the progress and also uh, the, the outcome. So what this means basically is that we handle a lot of personal data. And so um, as the point has been already made very clear is that as data custodians, we do have this great responsibility to protect the students from any privacy risk. Um, so in the other hand, we need learning analytics. I mean, that's what basically power our experiences. And it's, it's, uh, we need that basically to provide the learners with the best experience, but also the, the best outcome. And the quality of the data can make or break the analytics. It's also important for to further the research to be able to reproduce uh, the analysis, be able to compare and share. And all those actions can uh, have an inherent privacy risk associated to them. So um, basically the question becomes is how can we, can we keep doing the best learning analytics while still um, while not compromising in the privacy and security of the learners. Um, next slide, please. So it's um, to answer this type of questions that gave, um, uh, so that, that made the made us come up with like the CRCP project of trusted analytics. So it's um, it's when in this case we are not only talking about theory and research. Um, I, I would like to make it clear that we, what we set off to do is to also build an actual practical solution, because what we would like to offer is to offer an actual set of tools that practitioners can take and use on their data and LA experiments, and they'd be able to assess the, the, the level of privacy risk, but also be able to mitigate this risk and have an actual quantified measure that helps them understand how privatizing the data impacts the LA results. So um, trusted analytics has four key pillars. So the first one is about measuring the, the risk. And again, this goes beyond just a qualitative as, uh, assessment. We're talking about a quantitative measure and building a standard that any LA expert can, can take and use. Um, so after that, we, we also offer a set of uh, solutions to mitigate the risk. So that's basically our second pillar about privacy preserving solutions. And um, the third pillar is about assessing the impact of those privacy preserving solutions on the learning analytics and what is the best techniques or models that can be leveraged basically on the privacy preserved data. Our fourth pillar is basically what we are currently doing. So it's all about reaching out to the community and sharing what we know and what we have. Um, next slide, please. So to achieve this, we brought together uh, different partners and, and experts. As you can see, uh, many of them are, are here with us. So this work wouldn't be possible without this, this partnership. So we have LA researchers and education uh, service providers. And so we have UniSA here and also Navitas and EduGrowth. Um, for we as Educate Practera as a technology uh, 
education provider and data custodian, which also applies to Navitas as well. And we have the privacy and security data experts, um, Data61. And we also have um, CyberMag, which provides cybersecurity solutions. So this is really, as you can see, it's more about um, bridging the gap between research and practice and being able to actually apply the, 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 the research, all the research that we already have toward an actual um, practical solution. Uh, next slide, please. So at Trusted Analytics, we like to um, practice what we preach. So we basically build um, a secure collaborative environment where all the different partners can uh, work together and collaborate and share data safely. Mm -hmm. And we designed um, an experimental pipeline, which you can see. So this is the schematic of the experimental pipeline. And what you have on the left would be your uh, input data, which could be a database or a, a data stream. And so you those to, to make it to be clear, those data are already anonymized, so no PII information left. But as we already know, that is not enough to, to protect the privacy of, the, of, of the, the users. So we take those data and then we feed them into a risk assessment tool. Uh, this is R4, uh, the tool that has been developed by uh, Data61, which helps us uh, measure the, the risk on the data. So once we have assessed the level of risk, we can take the data and feed that into a learning analytic toolbox, which you see in, in roughly in the middle. So using this uh, learning analytic toolbox, we can run different models and baseline the, the solution or the outcome. And then once we have our baseline, we can then decide if we want to go the provable um, privacy risk mechanisms or the non-provable uh, privacy risk mechanism mitigation solution. And this is really dependent on what you are trying to do with the data in the sense that there is no uh, single solution fits all. So there are many different ways to uh, privatize your data and they all have a certain degree or level of validity depending on what you are trying to do or trying to achieve. So it's really a balance as Thierry mentioned. So it's about finding that sweet spot when you're trying to find your, your best solution in, in uh, preserving the utility in your data. So it could be that depending what who you depending the context, basically who you are sharing with, it might actually be enough for you to just uh, use a, a non provable mechanism like perturbation or binning. And so that's the top path uh, for perturbation. Or you need a more stringent or provable mechanism, and you might then use uh, differential privacy, and that would be the bottom path of producing like synthetic uh, data set. So once you have applied your mitigation solution and improved uh, and privatized your data, you can then uh, feed that back to the learning analytic toolbox and apply your learning analytics models on the privatized data based on the results. There is a little bit of uh, feeding back and forth between the LA uh, modeling toolbox and the um, the privacy the uh, data privacy solution, because you want to optimize your solution to find that sweet spot to have like the best um, privacy and security on the data, but at the same time the best outcome from the utility point of view. So once you optimize your solution, then it's all the way to the right. That's how you get your insights and outcome to to work with then you can share those insights and outcome so this is basically roughly our uh, experimental pipeline that we design and we've been working on this and and testing it and i will let chen um actually uh, walk you through an actual real use case that uh, was used with this experimental pipeline uh, so do we, you want just briefly to mention on the data that we collect and uh before yes. chen yeah just briefly thanks uh, yes, so um, the data used here come from an actual uh, Practera program. Uh, so the Practera programs, the, the way they work is uh, it, specifically in this use case. So this was a work integrating learning program for a business project. And it's a teamed project and we have mentors mentoring each team. 
and they are they have um, the, the the program is presented into the, the platform and they have different activities and milestones that they have to go through and they'll be able to interact within the tool to um, to access the different activities and interact together as a team but also inter interact with their mentor that provides them with feedback on their work so they can then take that feedback work use that feedback to um, to work on the on their assessment and and then submit that back. So there is this uh, feedback loop that helps um, improve the, the 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 experience. So um, so the, the the data set in here is basically the engagement or the activity data that shows us how the participants are uh, engaging with the the, the program material, the, the different activities and tasks. And in the other hand, as the outcome, we're looking at the scores data. So what we're trying to see is that how the engagement or the activities that the learners are doing on the platform impacts the actual score at the end of the program or the outcome. To and uh, we are wrapping up, I promise. So Chen will just give us a brief overview how we set up the whole experiment and then I will just show you some of the results. Yep, so before we wrap up. Okay, yeah, sure. So. I will explain the whole thing in simple words. There would be three major phases for our experimental design. So, for, of course, the first uh, phase is to create AOA models on the original data set, and we record them as the baseline models. The second phase is to apply the same models, but on the privacy preserved data to see the performance and the goodness of the fate. And in the final phase, we, uh, we, uh, we comprehensively assess the compa compatibility of the um, uh, processed, um, processed data in terms of uh, serving LA models and resembling, resembling to the original data set. So uh, I just give you the more details. So first step uh, for the create, creating a LA models is to do the feature engineering. So in our uh, experiments, we have designed a labeling system to categorize uh, students on activities. Then we count them on a weekly basis and summarize them in, in, uh, at a team level. So this is based on the uh, cost design. There, uh, in addition to this um, uh, student activity feature, so we have three more uh, team level features such as the regularity of time spending across uh, team uh, members. Um, in, as our current stage, we have included three uh, LA models after uh, we're doing the literature review. So basically, all the mo uh, models are linear regression based models because these are um, the most common or popular uh, LA models in linear analytics. So linear, uh, generalized learning, uh, linear regression models, mixed effect models, and uh, generalized uh, estimation equations. Um, more specifically for the model training, we, we, uh, we have another step to optimize, optimize the model structure. So for each uh, models, we only using a subset of features to pre, uh, to, for, for the prediction. This is to prevent uh, overfitting problems. And we aim to find the best uh, combination of features to, to do this. And to the next phase, we are applying this, uh, the, the uh, trained uh, or optimized um, model structure to the, and to the uh, privacy preserved data. So in current stage, we have three versions of data, two versions come from the R4 and one version of uh, data sets come from the GIN, which is uh, gener generative adversary networks. We train the model uh, on the privacy preserved data. When we're looking at the model, we pay atten more attention to the coefficients because, uh, because in linear regression models, the, this uh, coefficients represent the relationship between the features and the outcomes. We pay attention to the uh, direction, strength, and the robustness of these uh, correlations. More, um, uh, furthermore, we uh, have calculated uh, some metrics for the, to measure the good, goodness of fate, which is uh, information loss. Okay, I, can, so, I can take over because we need to <laughs> start <laughs> wrapping up soon. So uh, yeah, I mean, um, this is the, the pipeline that we basically, the basic idea is let's build the models with the raw data. Let's see how it holds after the we apply differential privacy mechanisms, right? And this is... Uh, there is uh, existing work in this area that uh, 
a few labs that did something similar, but in a fairly simple uh, models using just correlation analysis to uh, compare whether the correlation still holds before and after applying uh, whether differential privacy or adding some noise to the data. We added here this utility, uh, well, we call it goodness of it, but we call utility loss metric that basically uh, doesn't look only at the um, coefficients uh, and directions of the, of the association between uh, um, uh, variables and the outcome, but also compares the change in the R squared before and after applying data privacy and also takes into account the utility, uh, the um, uh, Information uh, information loss uh, loss uh, as as a part of the how good the model is after applying the official privacy and I will just briefly go to to the result because we really need to wrap up and sorry uh, we covered quite a lot of ground uh, the the whole what what we saw basically is that uh, adding uh, so there are three there are three models right with bin data we just uh, try to bin data into different groups. Uh, adding some noise and after applying differential privacy, we still find that most of the uh, variables, most of the uh, relationship between um, input variables and outcomes still hold after applying those privacy preserving methods. Uh, with um, the optimal model we found, and I think Jazzy, you can just say a few words, uh, yeah, on yeah, this one. Three words. So basically what we see here, if we take the example of the, the bin data solution, is that we can try different levels of binning. The more bins we use, we, the more granular the data are, closer we are to the original. But we can, as you can see here, I highlighted that we find a sweet spot where we can, by using like 50 bins for the um, engagement data, we can then still maintain a good level of utility, but also reduce the, 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 the risk, the privacy risk by 50%. So here we reduce the privacy risk by 60% by binning the score data in within six bins. So this is basically the important thing is that you are, we can see quantitatively that we're improving the, the privacy risk while still maintaining the utility of the data. Yeah. And the, the same, the same uh, similar results basically obtained after uh, adding noise to, to, to data, we still see the same direction of the association, same uh, variables become prominent uh, as uh, most important predictors of the outcome, while still reducing the, 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 the risk for what was here. Yeah, uh, so here it's the, the privacy risk uh, is reduced by 40 to 64 percent by adding about 20 20 percent level of noise to the activity data and by adding 10 percent of noise to the score data. And so, finally, and while still yes, finding the same level of utility with, with the models like goodness of fit, basically, and the same important features. Yeah. And finally, with the with the synthetic data, that one was the most challenging one, and we see you know quite quite a change uh, on the uh, when we apply the models on the raw data compared to the synthetic data, right? But there is still uh, some of those most prominent variables, uh, like like here we have the the feedback, and I have to say that we focused on weekly counts of uh, of uh, of the learning analytics related features just because you wanted to provide a simple use case that's been commonly used in the learning analytics field. And still here, after uh, when we applied the, the same models on the synthetic data, we still tend to find most of the variables still holding, being significant predictors of the of the outcome. Yeah. And again, I, I think, Jazia, we mentioned yeah, here, find yeah, here, here, here is a bit difference. This is the difference between when you're working with differential privacy compared to just a non-provable technique is that with the provable technique, we're looking at like a reduction between from original to after applying a, a privacy mechanism. While here we're talking about more uh, a privacy loss. So where it's more like a dial where we're actually testing different levels of privacy loss and we explore explored ranges between six and 20. Be it that like the, the, the smaller value is more private to the higher value of epsilon in this case is the less private. And we find a sweet spot or a balance at epsilon equal 11, basically, which reflects a level of privacy loss rather than a reduction in privacy risk. Yeah. But we're definitely happy to take this discussion further offline yeah. and we'd yeah. like to give a chance to Ruth just to wrap up. And okay. sorry, it took us a bit longer. 
as quickly as possible. So really what we're doing is there is no silver bullet, right? So there's a lot of research around, and you saw some of those amazing framework diagrams trying to solve the problem of privacy in one solution. That's just not going to happen for, for all the reasons that we went into. So what we're trying to do is that we don't need to wait for the silver bullet before we start implementing more privacy uh, pres preserving technologies and that's what we're doing. So we're also including, as you can see in that sort of um, column uh, number two, residual risk measurement, we're including a re-identification RIR measures into our um, corporate reports and dashboards so that we can start raising levels of awareness across the organization and teaching people about data privacy, every piece of data they look like, look at, there's a data privacy implication if they measure, if they share that and, and publish it or whatever. So they, they're starting to get better are educated with a, a re-identification risk measure next to all the data that they see in their dashboards. We're, we're automating some of those data reformation um, techniques that we talked about earlier and matching those into specific uh, um, analytics because as we said some uh, uh, reformation uh, approaches work better for other some types of uh, analytics. So we're doing that work now with those experiments so that we can start forming those matches and start actually putting tool sets together that will give you those in, in one go. So you're not having to do those experiments yourselves. Um, we have those pre-matched. We know what kind of data goes into these types of algorithms, the kind of outcomes that, that, account, that, um, that, that, we're, that you're looking for. And we've done the experiments, not just looking at the traditional R squared and information loss, but we're actually the predictive qualities of the outcomes to say, yes, this is a good match. This kind of privacy enhancing technique is a good match for this type of analytics. And we've even got some libraries to provide for it. So we can start building those solutions now. In fact, that's what we're doing with these experiments. And then we need to broaden the base. So we need to improve the risk measurement approach that we're taking today and actually turning that into a global discussion. It's not just confined within data science, but putting it into our reports, putting it into our policies and procedures, um, raising awareness and changing people's practices and attitudes towards privacy all the way through the organization. That's through visibility and measurement. Um, also, as I said, as you saw there, improving, creating more privacy aware learning analytics, uh, analytics that also um, uh, put the privacy into the models and the results and the outputs, as well as um, better matching those analytics to privacy preserving techniques. And then incorporating new approaches, we showed you some um, DP differential privacy approaches that we're looking at now. There's quite a lot of other approaches as well. There's a lot of cryptographic approaches that improve that are all around um, uh, uh, encryption, homomorphic encryption, zero knowledge privacy are examples of those. And there's also looking at differential privacy from the perspective of groups and the information that one, in, one individual can provide, um, which then can be inferred to another individual because they are a member of that group. And that's a whole area of research as well that, um, that um, can be looked into. And there's quite a lot of, of research there. So the list goes on. There's a lot more that can be done but there's plenty out there right now that we can start building into what we do, um, especially when we've done some of these um, predictive modeling experiments to sort of properly match up the technique with, with the analytics. I'll leave it there. I'm sorry, we went slightly over. Well, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> no uh, worries. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sreshko, Ruth, um, Thierry, Dejo, and uh, Chen for, for your presentation. Uh, I think we have time for maybe a couple of quick questions from the audience. We also we also happy to take the the questions offline if that's uh, if that's easier. So uh, yeah, I know we 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 wanted really to send the message out. I know it took us a bit more than we planned, and uh, yeah, thanks for everyone who managed to stay around. Ah, uh, thank you for sharing, Jasia. Thank so thank you message you, from, from Nisa and the, the recording will be available on the learning analytics learning network website and we're happy to forward questions to our Shreshko and team. Yeah, by all means get in touch um, with Shreshko or or and or or, or Jazia. Um, and uh, yeah, happy to answer questions that involved. Yeah, thank you. I guess everyone, everyone is rushing to yourself. other meetings. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Flo, thanks a lot for the, uh, Justin, thanks a lot for the opportunity and, uh,
next time will be shorter, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Thank you so much.